So, if you've ever been at our home for Shabbat, you know the ritual moments at our table are something of a comedic sketch. (laughs) The sun is setting, everyone is gathered, or at least everyone but one child, who suddenly remembered that they didn't close the hamster cage and took off back downstairs. (laughs) Meanwhile, another kid is whining that they're hungry and won't survive another second without food. And the third just knocked over their grape juice. But because this isn't enough chaos on its own, the dogs are, of course, playing their own game of tag, literally running circles around us. And I'm about to lose my mind. (laughs) Daniel, who doesn't seem to notice the chaos, (laughs) it's true. (laughs) He hands me the matches, and we start the blessings first over the candles, then over the children, and so on and so forth. It should be a moment to savor. It should be a moment to lean into and to be as present as I can. Every once in a while, I become so aware that I don't have that many Shabbats like this left with the kids while they are still young. But instead, all I can really think about is, do we really have to do the long kiddish? (laughs) I bet the salmon is definitely overcooked now. (laughs) Will the kids please just calm down for a minute? (laughs) And what time do I have to wake up tomorrow so I make it to family services on time? And what time is that wedding I'm officiating next week? I am so focused on the mental checklist of all the things that feel important in the moment that before I know it, the meal is done, it's time to clean up, and another Shabbat dinner with my family has passed. It is so easy to get lost in a life that focuses on what comes next, on what else we need to accomplish. But deep down inside, in one of those places that we work hard to avoid, a reality I am ignoring bubbles up from the pit of my stomach. There is really only one destination we are all headed towards, our death. It's uncomfortable to live with an awareness that we are someday going to die, that each of our stories and the stories of everyone we have ever known or loved will end. It's frightening. It reminds us of what little control we have. It's the fear in my 10-year-old voice when she looked at me out of nowhere recently and said, so the world just keeps going, but like, I'll no longer be in it. I just won't be there, but the world still will be. And yet here we are, observing Yom Kippur, a holiday that at its core is a dress rehearsal for our death. Welcome to your funeral. (laughs) Each of the rituals of Yom Kippur are designed to play act the end of our lives. This is why traditionally today, we don't eat, we don't have physical intimacies, we don't shower or wear deodorant, and we don't wear fancy things or leather. These are the concerns of the living. And today we are trying to channel the perspective of a world where we are gone. We customarily dress in our burial garments. Many wear a white shroud, a white kittle, as if we are literally ready to be buried. And of course, today, in a few moments, we will say the vidui, a prayer typically recited on our deathbeds. Five times over Yom Kippur, we will have these moments of internal confession. These viduis where we reckon as honestly as we can with who we really have been, and not forgive ourselves for the best of our intentions. These words call us to consider all the ways we have missed the mark, to look back on our cumulative actions and transgressions and atone for them. And then, in the centerpiece of our liturgy, words we just recited, we have Unatana Tokaf, who will live and who will die, a terrifying poem written a thousand years ago that forces us to consider all the ways we could die this year. Who by fire? Who by water? Who at the right time and who prematurely? The entire passage is a list of questions about how and when we might die. And they are not rhetorical. If we do Yom Kippur right, we spend a full 25 hours in a dry run of our own funeral, forcing us to reckon with the questions of, have we lived the lives we wished we had lived? Have we been the people we hoped to be? 
Have we spent our time with care and purpose? Or have we wasted our lives on trivialities? Our world, the systems we humans have created for ourselves and each other, is so good at keeping thoughts of our mortality at bay. We are encouraged to be destination driven, to always be looking for the next best thing, to live and plan for the next moment, and to not think about a world where our moments will inevitably run out. The average span of a human life is something like 4,000 weeks, and that's it, if we're lucky. It's painful to confront just how limited our time in this world is. It's even more painful because we know in the back of our minds that every day we are taking these precious moments that we call life and letting them disappear down the rabbit hole of endless social media streams or an inbox that feels Sisyphean to clear or any of the other distractions that modern society throws at us. But when we stare down on mortality, we are forced to acknowledge that time is finite that the only guarantee in our life is that time is going to run out. We don't know if we will be here a year from now, not to mention a decade. And so given this uncertainty, the only question we can really answer is, how should I live right now? There's an idea in psychology I keep thinking about known as second order change. It's the notion that we really can become new people, that we really can live a life that's significantly different from the life we have lived up to now. It's why for so many people, their first significant health care is a moment that changes them forever. And it's why for thousands of years, Judaism has pushed us to play act our own funerals every Yom Kippur. When we look, at our, own, when we look our own impending death straight in the eye, hopefully we can start to have that second order change. Hopefully we can change our priorities, change how we are living, and become that better version of ourselves that is waiting. There's this section in the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat where one of the great rabbis of our tradition, Rava, is clearly struggling with this idea. He's imagining a moment of judgment for each of us, a reckoning on every life. What are the questions that would be asked of us? What are the questions that we should evaluate a life by? 1,800 years ago or so, Rava, Rava suggested these six. And I will read them slow so you have a moment to think about them. Did we have integrity in our work? Did we make time for a spiritual life? Did we care for our family, given and chosen? Did we hold on to hope? Did we continue to learn and grow for our whole life? And finally, were we true to ourselves? When I think about answering those questions for myself, there are parts of the answers that I would be proud of. But there are also parts of each of those questions that hurt a little, that cut too close to the places where I know I'm not living the life that I should be living. When we play act our funeral, when we recite we Dewey, when we attempt to answer Rava's questions about how we have been actually spending our time the purpose of Yom Kippur becomes clear. The work that we are doing here today on this holiday is a training ground for how we should live our lives the rest of the year. It's meant to remind us that the time to create a life of meaning is now. There is an urgency to think about how we prioritize because as Unatana Tokhev says, we don't know if we will live or when we will die. In a few weeks, I turn 40. And I realized I've already used up 2,000 of my weeks, <laughs> if I'm lucky. And if I'm lucky, I will have 2,000 more weeks left to live. They say by the time kids graduate high school, we've spent 80% of the time that we'll ever have with them. My eldest is a seventh grader. It hurts every time I think about how precious every day at home is and how easily I let those moments slip away. Oh, we need young Colin for your sermon right now. <laughs> the reality that Yom Kippur drives home is that there will be a time that is the last time I will have a Shabbat dinner with all the people that I love. And I don't know when that could be. It could be this Shabbat, or it could have been the one three nights ago. Today we face our deaths so we can be sure to really live in the weeks that we have left. And so this is my blessing for us. Gemara Chatimah Tovah. 
May we all be inscribed for a year of sweetness and good health. May we be inscribed for a year where we are wholly present for all of the special moments. And may we spend a year living the lives that we want to be living.